What's up friends? Guess what I'll be talking about today? Yep, you've guessed it. 3D printing. You know, it seems to me that everyone and their uncle has a 3D printer in their homes these days, except for me of course. But what's all the fuss about? Is it really as easy and effortless as I'm led to believe, or is there more to it than we're told? I don't really have much hands-on experience with it, but let's find out when I put this little beauty together. Salutations everyone and welcome back. Today we've got something completely different. And by completely different I mean exactly the same because what have we got here? We've got a model kit of a TARDIS. Not just any old TARDIS, it's a TARDIS that I've done before. It's the Paul McGann 8th Doctor TARDIS from the 1996 TV... Sorry, just a minute, hold on. Don't mind me. Hello? Oh, hello there. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah, yeah, you? I mean, I've seen you busy. What? What now? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm just talking about it now, yeah, sure. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, fine, that's absolutely fine, yeah. Yeah, 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 knock yourself out. Okay then, over to you then. Well, that's odd. He just hung up on me. Hey, everybody. My name's Philip Siegel, and I was the executive producer of the 96 TV movie, Doctor Who, starring Paul McGann. And it's obviously been many generations, or I should say regenerations, since uh, my doctor flew in the TARDIS. But hey, here we are now in my hobby shop, believe it or not. I'm Spruverse. You can check me out on YouTube. Uh, I'm Spruverse or Instagram at Spruverse or my... Uh, you can check me out on my website is uh, Spruverse.com. But anyway, I stumbled upon PB Props and Anthony's channel several years ago and I caught him building a version of the 8th uh, Doctor's TARDIS. I was so impressed with the detail and how it looked. I reached out to him to say hi and we became friends. Cut to today and I know he's challenged with building a 3D version of it, but really what he's talking about is the, the complications of working with 3D printed kits. I know because I'm working on several myself and it is a challenge. Uh, but he's a talented prop maker and he knows what he's doing, so we're all going to learn a little bit from him about what it takes to actually build these types of things, and I'm looking forward to this build series. Anyway, be well, uh, take care of yourselves, build something, and let's see how it gets on. Thanks very much for that, Phil. I am looking forward to making this model. Now, folks, while I've got you here, why don't you go and check out Phil's channel? It's his model universe. He calls it Spruverse. He's also got an Instagram account. I'll put the links down in the old description, and probably there's a link to his YouTube channel here as I say this. Now, while you're there, go and subscribe. He has so much work going on. He, he is an absolute machine, and his work is of such a high standard. It's, it's quite unbelievable, actually. But I really do think he would appreciate if you go and check him out, subscribe, and if you do subscribe, let him know that PB Prop sent you. Okay, let's get on with having a look at this kit. Let's just move that out of the way and draw our attention back to the kit. Now this kit is 3D printed and it comprises of nine main pieces. So you've got a base, a roof, corner posts, front and corner posts back. You've also got two side walls, back wall and two doors. I do really like the fact that the graphics are supplied and they are supplied as prints on a sticky back so you can just stick them on. You've also got some detail elements down here. Uh, you've got the window frames, they just click into the backs of the doors and the walls. You've got also the printed window panes themselves, the pull to open panel and the lamp. So. What I love about this is its simplicity. It's just designed all to click and slot together. So really, I'm hoping that my time on this is going to be quite limited. It, there shouldn't be too much involved. But first impressions, really like it. So here's a closer look at the window assembly. Very simply, two parts. It's the outer frame and the printed 3D pane. Now I've never seen that before and I'm quite surprised by it. It's very very thin but as you can see it's a little bit warped so that's going to need some work doing to it but we'll come to that later on. But anyway those pieces there slot into the back of here and then that entire assembly literally sits in like that and I really think that's quite a quite a clever little way of doing it. I'm quite pleased with that and I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that works in practice. 
Look at this tiny little bugger. This is the phone panel, and just like the window frames, it slots into position. But what really impresses me with this, particularly given the fact that this is an FDM print, it actually has two hinges printed on here. You can barely see them, but they are there. And even more surprising is the little thumb handle. I mean, this thing is tiny. Well, at least it saves me from having to build that. But yeah, that in particular is a really lovely touch. I'm, I'm quite, quite impressed with, with the level of detail on this. These are the front doors. Uh, they are meant to be practical and they do have hinges on them. There are little pins there, 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 and there. I am a little concerned that they may be a bit on the weedy side. Like, you know, potentially could they snap? If it were me designing this kit, I would have left actually in the model space for little brass pins. But that's just me, you know, this, I'm sure this will work fine. Anyway, these pins slot into the base. You know, you've got two here and two here. So you've also got uh, similar receiver holes just inside here as well. Now there is one small issue with these doors. They do need a bit of work to make them practical because as they stand right now, without any work, once they slot into this thing, they can only be either fixed shut or fixed open. They can't swing at all, but we'll come to that a bit later on. The other nice thing about this kit is that it does appear that it could come with another set of doors for the back. I mean, here we have the base and you can see quite clearly four pins. So it's two sets of doors, one at the front and one at the rear. For this particular model, we only have one set of doors and that's the back wall, complete with locator pins that will just slot in like that, and you've got a fixed back wall. What I do find a little bit curious about this kit is that there is no door handle provided. Strange in the fact that there is one printed on the phone panel, but nothing here. So, I mean, it's no great issue to me because I've built loads of these things before, so I can just fabricate another one to fit on here. However, what I do find quite curious and also quite amusing is that they've borrowed my magnet idea for the lock. Long-term viewers may recall that basically I had this idea that if we use a magnet to pull the door shut, it saves any potential damage from the handle. So I suppose imitation is the highest form of flattery, so I don't mind. Well done guys for taking the idea, I mean, that's why I published it. Look at this cute little bug, isn't it fantastic? You'll probably notice that this is the lamp and lamp housing for the kit. It's printed in resin, which means the fidelity of it is far greater than the rest of the kit. But I absolutely love this, this little thing, so well done guys. It comes with a top cap, the Fresnel lens and the base. This little nubbin down here is the top little cap that goes on top of this piece. Uh, it does not come with the struts that connect the top to the bottom, or the little uh, detail struts that go across the lens itself. But with a little bit of wire and some snippers, that's easily rectified. I have to say I am deeply impressed by this piece. I mean, well done guys, that's a fantastic piece. I think you've uh, really surpassed yourself there. I look forward to building it. So my friends, this is the kit in its entirety. And I'm quite looking forward to putting it together. I mean, it's just a matter of grabbing bits, gluing them to other bits, slapping some paint on, and Bob's your auntie, right? No, a kit, as always, like this, comes with a few caveats. And I would like to discuss matters of design and tolerance in the next chapter. See you there. Well, oh, I'm at my desk, I'm on my squeaky chair, and I'm at the computer, so that can only mean one thing. I'm going to be talking about design and tolerances. Now, one of the benefits of designing a kit like this is that on paper, or even on the computer, everything slots and fits together perfectly because mathematically it all meshes. So, for example, a one centimeter wide tab will fit rather neatly into a one centimeter wide gap. However, out in the physical world, the reality is quite different, and that's all down to two factors. The first is the tolerances on your computer model, and secondly, it's the tolerances that the printer that you're using is capable of. So, tolerances are the permissible limits of variation within the physical dimension. So, for example, a 2 meter wide car would not fit down a 2 meter wide tunnel. So either the car has to be made smaller, or the tunnel has to be made wider. Um, here. Let me show you, I'll demonstrate what I mean. Now I'm going to use these two wall pieces as an example of design and tolerance. This wall panel here is four millimeters thick from 
that side to that side, four millimeters thick. Now it has to slot into this little channel here, and that also is four millimeters wide. Now, recall what I said about the two meter wide car trying to fit down a two meter wide tunnel. It's just not going to happen because both parts are vying to occupy the same physical space. So one of two things have got to happen. We either make this wall piece here thinner, or we make this slot wider. Now, in terms of this model, because it's already been made and printed, it's going to be easier for me to open up this channel, and I'm going to open it up by about a quarter of a mil, so it will go from 4 millimeters to 4.2 millimeters, or 4.25, or thereabouts, it doesn't really matter. Just so long as that I open this up very slightly, that will then allow that to be received into that space. Now that tolerance issue that I was just talking about affects the entire model. So anywhere where two parts physically mesh together are going to try and occupy the same space to some degree. So for example, on this wall, we've got the three steps under the sign box and the back of the sign box itself. That then slots into this corner post area here, but both pieces want to occupy the same space. So to get around that and to get around the problems with all of this, I'm going to have to take a file and very gently remove material from the backs of every surface. And that's going to be absolutely fun, I can assure you. On top of all that, 3D printing right across the board actually isn't as accurate as you probably think it is, especially on the domestic home gamer machines. Take for example this window here, this window frame. This is supposed to slot into the back of there, but with the best will in the world that is going absolutely nowhere. It's not going in there at all, it's just too big. Now I did a quick check on this. This window frame is 1.5 millimeters in both directions, both horizontally and vertically, too big. Now you might think 1.5 mil, that's not very much. Well actually, if you were to scale that up to full size, 1.5 millimeters equates to just over 90 millimeters, or three quarters of an inch. That is huge. Now, where this problem lays could either be in the CG model or the printer, I don't really know as I don't have access to either, but if they're a perfect fit on the computer, then this must be a factor of the printer, and this is certainly something that needs to be looked at and dialed in. It's not a huge issue to me here, because I can, I can basically make this thing fit. Right, we're back on the bench again, and I think it's worth pointing out that this is an FDM print. It's a, it's a method where there is a nozzle rather like the end of my pen here, and through it, comes a filament of plastic, PLA or ABS, and that's heated up and it lays itself on a heated bed. And essentially the, the extruder sits there and draws the piece until you get something that looks like this. Now the problem with this, and it's across the board, is because there is heat involved, there is the potential and the risk for warpage, especially where anything touches the heated bed. Now you probably won't be able to see it, but all along this edge here, and here, and to a lesser degree on this side, there is a curve and a bow. Let me just show you, it's, it's, this, it's this dark edge here. So rather than that being nice and flat, it warps upwards. Now, if I run my finger across it, you can hear it, you can hear that lip. So that's going to need to be sorted out. However, it seems to happen on every straight edge. Again, you probably can't see it terribly well, but this edge here bows inwards. There's a little bit of bow along the top of here, but it's also particularly noticeable on these corner post caps. They are completely bowed. It bows in that way and also in that way. So I've got a little bit of repair work to do with that. Let me show you some other examples of this. Okay, so I've got a bit of a, a dry assembly here. We've got the base and the corner posts and the sign box frontage, and that's sitting rather prettily on here. Now the base itself does, uh, does have a little bit of warping, not too much. A little bit of a lip here, and one of the corners is lifting, but again, a bit of filing and some filler will sort that out. Our main issue with this is that the roof, which was printed in the same way as the base, and the same way as the wall, flat, on a heated piece, there is a little bit of uh, warpage going on, especially on all the flat edges here. So. This has been designed rather cleverly to slot into this piece here, and yes, it fits brilliantly. However, due to the warpage, if I was to turn this round and try to slot it into place, it 
is having absolutely none of it. Turn it around again, still not having any of it. Turn around, yet again, not having any of it. And again, that's because of this, this bowing and this warping. So it's not a huge problem, but it is a pain in the ass to fix. I really, really don't like sanding this stuff. It, it sort of goes through me. So I've got to sort all that out. The other issue with this, again, it goes back to the doors. Now, recall that I did say that there is a lip on the back here. If I was to take one of the doors, for example, and I told you earlier, right at the very start of this, that this kit can either, if I can get it in, no, it doesn't want to go in. Why does it not want to go in? Well, I'm not going to force that. Let's take another door. So the doors slot into a little pin there and into... Hang on, let me look at how organised I am. Okay, so that's more or less it. So this is what's supposed to happen with the doors. They're supposed to open and close, but in this form, in its current state, there is no way that's going to happen. And that's actually down to a design issue. Yes, there's a bit of that warpage going on with the, uh, the back of the posts coming into play, but actually it's more to do with the design. So the door is pretty much refusing to swing open here. Look, it's jamming. And that really is down to this pin. Now this door itself is designed like a standard door, a standard house door. Everything's at 90 degrees to itself but the pin changes the door's behavior. Let me show you on a real door. Here we are at my living room door. I'm sure you're all familiar with what a door looks like, what with you having them at home yourself. But what I really want to do is draw your attention to the hinge and in particular its placement. See how it's just offset from the trailing edge. This informs that door how to open. The pivot point is here. And what that does is tell the door to swing out and away from the door aperture. Now on that model, the pin hinge itself is moved slightly further in and changes the relationship between the door, its own hinge, and the framework. Let me just demonstrate that for you. Here's a mock-up, forgive me, it's not to scale, but this piece here would be your door, and that would be your corner post or your door frame. As we've just discussed, on a full-size door, with the pin hinge being here, that enables the door to move out and away from the frame, and it goes back in rather neatly. However, you change that to a pin that's pivoted at this point, and it changes the whole nature of the way the door moves. Observe. Bonk! This whole back end collides and crashes into this, and because it's a mock-up, it's able to knock this completely out of the way. However, if this was a fixed point, and we swivel it like this, it won't move. It will want to move, but it won't. So, what's the answer? Well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? We need to round off this back edge. Now, if you go and look at the Character Options toys, in particular the TARDIS toys, and have a look at their doors, they've done exactly the same thing, and it's exactly the same thing that I've done on my previous models, where I've put in a, a pin hinge. It's just a case of taking the model kit and rounding those edges off. Well, I think I've pretty much established that there is a fair amount of work ahead of me to prep all of this to get it to fit together nicely. You know, it is a 3D printed piece, and it does come with certain caveats, as I said at the very beginning. But then so do commercial kits. There's always preening to do to get these things to gel nicely. However, I would like to stress, if you want to get into 3D printing yourself, don't see it as this magic tool that's going to suddenly make everything for you, because it's just not the case. It's not going to happen. There's always a certain amount of work to be done. Okay, it saves you time in building all the detail parts out, but you still have to make the thing work and go together. So, that is precisely what I'm going to be doing next. Alrighty then, we're at the very unglamorous phase of post-processing, and the way to think about that is essentially you are just tidying up all these panels before you assemble them. Now, as we know, this has been FDM printed, and unfortunately, with that style of printing, it does leave thousands of layer lines all over the print. Now, you can sort of see them and even hear them when I do something like this. See, it's not smooth. Layer lines there, 
and layer lines there. Now, thankfully, the guy who printed this kit out for the client actually used an ironing function and it has sort of smoothed it out, but it's not quite there yet. And I do have to take all of this out. If he hadn't, there's no way on God's earth I'd be even able to touch this kit. Anything lenticular that goes right through me, a bit like nails on a chalkboard. So I'm gonna go off. I'm going to smooth this out as much as I possibly can. I'm going to do all the filing that we previously talked about. Then we can meet back here a bit later on for the dry assembly. <laughs> I can't stand this. Oh, it's just worse. Even worse. I need something to bite on. Uh, that. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Jesus Christ.
See, this is when Torrens has come into play. I am now chasing it everywhere. Okie dokie. Better go together this time. Yay! Already is broken. Just a little bit of foiling, and the edge here is breaking off, so I'm going to have to quickly fix that. The trials and tribulations of FDM printing unravels like an old woolly jumper. Look, I don't mind admitting to you that that was excruciating. I thought that getting this thing together to fit nicely would take me about a day, maybe a day and a half tops. That last eight and a half minutes you've just watched is the boiling down of over a week's worth of work where I was filing every single surface, sanding and scraping, you name it. I did everything to get this together. Now, it does fit together rather nicely. There's no gaps, which is great, so it's tighter than a duck's ass underwater. However, there are a couple of issues that have cropped up. Now, do you remember me saying that the window frames were a bit too big, both horizontally and vertically? Well, it didn't occur to me at the time that also their thickness may be an issue. Now, you have just seen me playing with these doors and getting them to work, and they opened fantastically. That was without the window frames. You can see the window frames are in, but now watch what happens. It kind of opens, well it does open, but not very far. What's actually happening is the backs of the windows are crashing into the corner posts. So, in the next stage I'm going to have to sort that out and work out a way of, well, basically rectifying that. So all that's left to do really for me is to glue all this together, texture it, paint it, and then, I suppose, deliver it to the customer. Anyway, I will see you back here once this is finished.
got a little bit of repair work to do. You can probably just see up here, the print is incomplete on this little step. It just sort of goes along there and then stops and then steps down and then returns. No idea what happened there, but time to fix that. Stand together, united as one. Forward on we go, facing friend and foe. We will know what it is. We have not time for that. If we make mistakes, we are lost. We are lost. We stand together, united as one. Forward on we go, facing friend and foe. We will know what it is. We have not time for that. If we make mistakes, we are lost. Well, I think you get the general idea of what went down here, especially if you're a long-time viewer. But if you aren't, and if you're interested in how exactly I paint and weather TARDIS models of this scale, or how I build them from scratch in the first place, then I'll leave a couple of links to some further videos at the end of this one. Also, while I have you here, and before we get into the full reveal, if you'd like to help keep this channel alive so that you can carry on watching me make nice things, then please do feel free to leave a like, share your thoughts down in the comments section down below, and while you're at it, why not subscribe and share this video with all your friends? I'm told it really helps the metrics in the long term. But if you really want to go the extra mile, then why not consider supporting this channel over on my Patreon page by making a donation, either as an ongoing concern at your discretion of course, or as a one-off. Either way, I'd appreciate it greatly, and your contributions will go towards the costs of build materials for future projects, but no pressure obviously. Right then, let's get back to it. Thank you. 
Well, there you are then, it's all done, and the Eighth Doctor's looking rather happy. Now, looking back on this project, I think it's been a really successful build, even though for a kit it took way longer than I'd anticipated, and it wasn't quite as straightforward as I'd hoped it would be, but I'm really happy with the results, and when you look at it, you'd be hard pressed to tell that it's a 3D printed kit, which is always a bonus. Now, the client has already seen it, and he seems pleased, so that's really nice too. If I were to make any constructive criticisms, there'd only be one, and it would be about the windows. They really need a total rethink, given that they do interfere with the door opening. I'd suggest doing it in the way that I do it, with much wider window frames that sit flush with the rear of the door. Not only would this avoid the collision of parts, but you'd also avoid seeing the edges of the window panes from the outside. And that really is my main disappointment with this kit. It really does sort of ruin the overall effect. But it is a small detail, and I can overlook it on what is otherwise an exemplary kit. So, what do I think of 3D printing, then? Well, exactly what I've been saying for the last 20 years now. There's no denying it. It's an absolutely fantastic tool. So, if you're not confident in your scratch building abilities, or you just can't be asked with dealing with all that fiddly nonsense, then 3D printing is pretty much the way to go these days, especially since the printers themselves are so cheap now. Suffice to say, I do have a few thoughts when it comes to FDM printing. I really don't think it's suited for finely detailed stuff. It's just too clunky for that. I mean, it's okay for bulky items, but with the amount of cleanup involved, especially with this kind of model here, I could have probably have done this just as quick by scratch building it. That said, if I were to go down the 3D printed route for something small like this, I'd definitely choose resin printing over FDM any day. There's just no question of that, as the fidelity and the resolution is just far superior. At the end of the day, though, I do think that it's really more about choosing the right printer, or at least the right tool, for the right job. I mean, you wouldn't build an entire house with just a hammer, would you? No, you'd use other tools. And that certainly applies here, too. Before I wrap things up here, I do just want to briefly touch on PLA, because I think there's a few things worth noting that you should bear in mind. Now, I do know that it's more stable in printing terms than ABS when it comes to warping and peeling off, but I am concerned by a couple of factors. The first is that despite it being a complete bitch to sand, and that it wants to gum up even if you slightly look at it with sandpaper, I have noticed that it can be extremely brittle, and often wants to delaminate along the layer lines, which can be somewhat problematic, so please do pay attention to that when you're post-processing. The second issue has my attention, and it's all to do with the material's longevity, given that it is a biodegradable product. It does break down over time, especially with prolonged exposure to sunlight. Also, heat plays in on this too, so it does make me question, how will this impact your work in the long term? So maybe PLA is better for making tooling masters with, that you can take moulds from and pour up casts. At least that way you know you're not going to risk losing your work as time passes. Anyway, on that bumshell, I've had a lot of fun here today, and I hope that you have too. But I've got things to be doing and kids to teach, so until next time, please do take care of yourselves, thanks so much for watching, and don't forget to check out Phil's Spoovers accounts. Trust me, it'll be worth it, you won't regret it. Anyway, bye for now then, and I'll speak to you again soon.